The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. The following video is presented by the Center for Educational Media in partnership with Professional Educators of Tennessee's Leader U Conference. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Biology, Chemistry, Physical Science, Algebra, Geometry, Anatomy and Physiology in Nigeria and the U.S. He earned a Master's in Curriculum and Instruction from Freed Hardman University and a Ph.D. in Biomedical Science, Emphasis in Cancer <coughs> Biology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis, Tennessee. He is currently teaching AP Biology, DE Biology, and DE Anatomy and Physiology at White Station High School in Memphis, Tennessee. It just wears me out thinking about all that math. At this point, my eyes just glaze over. In addition to teaching, he is an AP Biology reader, loves to mentor new teachers, and is the president of Education Reforming Foundation Reforming Education in Africa and America Free. Formerly Critical Thinking Education Services, a nonprofit tutoring service that targets low income students. Please welcome Kazir Madhu. Well, welcome to this session this afternoon. One of the things I was wondering as we were walking in was how come I have such a large crowd? What <laughs> made you come? Was it just the topic or the name, or you just want to hear an African accent? Now, as you can tell, before I get on, um, I have a slight Mississippi accent. So what I tell my kids at the beginning of the year, and this is what they do, if you don't understand when I get excited and go too fast, you can always just do your hand and slow me down, or just nod your head and smile and pretend you understand everything I say. So we'll get along pretty well. So for the next 90 minutes, I'm told I'm supposed to talk about organized chaos. I am not going to spend 90 minutes, and I am not going to do all the talking. After teaching for about a couple of months, a couple of years ago, one of my students finally said, Dr. Madhu, you think you're very slick. You made us do all the work while you just get paid. <laughs> I said, I thought that was the plan. It took you this long to figure out. So you will be engaged in doing a lot of the work we're going to do and a lot of the talking, and I will serve as a facilitator, which is what my title here says. So please, be ready to do some talking and contribution. Since I've already been introduced, I will not spend too much time talking about myself now. That was done by my student, and I actually told her if she spent half the time studying instead of doing this, she could have passed that test. So I won't spend so much time doing a lot of introduction, but. Uh, I will tell you, I teach in the largest school district in the state of Tennessee. So, and I have to say this again, I'm from White Station High School, go Spartan. <laughs> so I teach a bunch of kids that are considered pretty smart. It's a magnet school, but I've also taught in the extreme um, level where I've taught kids that were in eighth grade and they were reading at first grade level. So I've experienced both ends of the world, and I know what it is to teach students that are self-motivated and students that are not motivated. And I've also taught in two continents. So I've taught where the kids had everything they had to learn, they needed to learn, and where kids had basically nothing they needed to learn. So I come to you here not as one who is an expert in, the, in, in this field, but one who has experienced quite a lot and still learning. So my goal today is to ask for your input and contribution because I know I have wonderful teachers present among us, principals, administrators. 
So feel free to disagree with me on any proposal I make. Feel free to correct and to give me your own opinion. So we'll leave here happy and with much knowledge to add in our classroom. So before I start, there are some things I need to lay, some groundwork. What does it mean to you if somebody says effective teaching? What does an effective teaching look like? Or what does an effective teaching strategy look like to you? Now this is where your turn to speak. And I have some gift I brought here from Memphis. So if you get enough check marks on your, um, what's this thing called, whatever it is, you will get, if you get enough check marks, you will get a gift from me before you go. So let me start. What does effective teaching look like to you? Or what does it sound like when you hear the word effective teaching? Engaged students. Engaged students. To engage the student, OK. What comes to your mind? What pops up in your mind? Effective teaching. Um, connecting with, teacher, uh, with students. Who said that? Oh, gosh, I can't walk all the way there. You, you, you have a marker in front of you, so you give yourself the point. And my kids do this all the time. OK, we're going to stop there first. So there, there, there are two, there are, there's, a, there's one word that has been repeated twice. What word is that? Student. And that's something I cannot disagree with or I find troubling. That every time they come with strategies for teachers, their main focus or their only focus is how does it benefit the student? And for many years, that was all I could think about. Any strategy that they come up with, how does my student benefit from it? So no matter how difficult or stupid it may sound, coming from the boss, we have to do it because the students benefit from it. So then I thought, why can't I also benefit from this strategy? Or how can I tweak it a little bit to where I don't get stressed? At the end of the day, the kids learn but I go home and take some Tylenol and get admitted into the ICU ward. <laughs> so for every strategy that comes up that I've thought about, I usually ask myself, can I make this engaging with the student? Can I make it effective and also less stressful for me as a teacher? If I'm supposed to be remain in this job for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, I will need to do it in a way where I don't go home feeling stressed. Our research says most teachers quit after the first three years. And that same research says teaching starts getting easier after, guess what year? The fourth year. So just when you want to reap the reward, you quit the job. So think about it this way. If you can modify a strategy that where you don't get stressed and yet is effective for the children, it's something worth considering. So let me lay down some disclosure. You know, you look around today, everything you see has some warning labels and disclosures. So I'm going to lay some of mine down. Number one, as you can tell, I am not a presenter. I don't know what I did wrong to be asked to come present today. <laughs> I'm a teacher. Frankly, I've not, never presented in this crowd, in last crowd before. So saying that to say, I am not an expert in this. So if your expectations were this high, can you bring it low, low, low about this side? <laughs> so I am not going to wow you at the end of it all because some of the things I'm suggesting are things I do. So I'm sharing my experience with you, not telling you something from a research-based you know, I used to do scaffolding years before it was called scaffolding. I still don't understand the concept of scaffolding, but I know I do something called scaffolding. Now they're talking about 3D learning. Don't know what that means, but I'm sure I do it. <laughs> so I don't have all this ed educational knowledge, based research things, but I think I've done a pretty good job, as we'll tell probably later on. So I'm not a presenter, I'm a teacher. I'm just going to share ideas with you. And um, secondly, the TEA, which I didn't know I was not supposed to say the TEA in this professional meeting, but the TEA and the Department of Education monitor the preparation of this presentation. 
no teacher or student was harmed in the making of this PowerPoint. So we're all safe that. Okay, quickly, let's get on to the work. If you look at these pictures here, these two pictures, who would you say is the new teacher, or who would you say is the seasoned teacher? Which of them? Do you think this is the new teacher or the seasoned teacher? This is seasoned teacher. Ah, and this is the... <laughs> Why do you think this is a seasoned teacher? Why do you think this is a new teacher that knows, doesn't know what he's doing? Yeah, really. <laughs> he's confident. Okay, so he's confident and the kids are probably working somewhere while he's thinking of the next vacation to take. Well, will it surprise you if I say, sometimes, frankly, I do this in my class. I mean, I don't face the other way while the kids are working. But I do this sometimes. And this was me many years ago, many, many, many years ago. Uh, so you can tell that one, my hair has fallen off and my skin has gotten darker. <laughs> so if I were to ask you, what challenges make your job more difficult? So I scouted the internet. This is a non-scientific research. But I read everything I could find on the internet that talks about things that make a teacher's job difficult. I interviewed teachers. I read books. And in the long run, I came up with certain lists. You have that list on your, on your tables. So I'm going to ask you, there are three categories of people here. We have the new teachers. We have the seasoned teachers and both. So looking at that list, some of you don't have it on your table, so I would ask that, you see, we're going to make some adjustment, which is part of what we're going to discuss, organized chaos, when things are not working as well as you wanted them to. So the group of teachers here would kindly turn around and face this table here for this activity. See, we have to adjust, make do. So what I want you to do is, you have a marker on your table, put where you find on that list something that you feel is challenging to only seasoned teacher, put an S. Something you find that is challenging to only new teachers, put an N. Then something you think is challenging to both seasoned and new teacher, put a B. So you have just three minutes. Remember, I don't have time. Working long hours. Uh, when, I, when I did this research, you know, one of the things that really fascinated me was when they put the list of challenges in hierarchy, salary came last for seasoned teacher. But when you listen to the news, they make it seem as if that's all teachers complain about. Most teachers do not. Either they've given up or they found a third job or fourth job. So, New teachers, seasoned teachers, even though they complained that salary was one of the uh, challenges, it came in way at the bottom there. There were other things that were bothering them. So are you ready for the answer? OK. Um, why not if I hold on to the answer till the end? This is what I'm focused on today. I want to address things that are common to both seasoned and new teachers. And those are the three things that both teachers said were challenging. Discipline problem, emotional stress, and different learning needs. Don't change your answer. I'm about to give you the answer at the end of it all. But if you look at this, there's something co common or something that unites all three. These are things we can change. These are things that is within our control. We can't control the salary they pay us, so we can complain all we want. It's not going to change. We can change the class size. We can change the endless faculty meetings and workshops and seminars and presentations and PLCs. And I'm sorry, am I grabbing? So we, we can change all that, 
So we can end up just talking about it all day long. So why not let's focus on aspects that A, bother both seasoned and new teachers, and B, things that we can change based on our teaching practices. So my goal today in discussing this topic is to make suggestions to you that could help you address this. As I said, I'm not, I won't consider myself a very good teacher, but I think I'm a very effective teacher because I look for ways that can make the job very effective to the students and also to me. So that's the set of things we're going to talk about. Now, there are some things that keep me up at, late at night. When I can't sleep, I stay up thinking about these things. Number one on my list is, why do we have so many teaching strategies coming up every year? Just when I get used to one or try to learn one, they throw another one at me. Is it that the kids are changing or the teachers are getting lazier or dumber or what? So we're getting new strategy. We don't even learn or get one to be very, in most countries in Europe in, or in Africa, a lot of the teaching strategies they, uh, or teaching method or school practice, they allow to follow from kindergarten to those kids graduate in 12th grade. Then they assess it. Because it takes them years, and these are European countries and so-called backward countries, Africa. They actually take time to think about these things and they see how well it works from kindergarten to 12th grade before they bring in any drast uh, drastic changes. Because you don't know if this is going to be effective until you see the end. But before kids even get past from 6th to 7th grade, we hear of something new. The second thing that keeps me awake at night, those of you from different school districts and schools here, what do you need to make an A in your class? What's, what's an A? For me, it's 93. What's it in your school? OK, it's 93. In my son's school, you need just a 90. In some schools, actually, you need, I think, a 95. Do you know what you need to get an A in college in Africa? It's 70. Well, regardless of what you, uh, the number you gave, the question is, how did they come up with these numbers? Is it research based? Why do we think mastery has to be from 70 to make a D? So when we have these arbitrary numbers we just throw around as this is an A, this is a B, this is a B, this is a C, how did we develop those numbers? The sad thing is education is one of the few places where we, don't, we do policies and we do things not based on research. A lot of things, school start time, they are actually against research, and yet we do them. I digress. But the major thing we're going to talk about today that keeps me up late at night is, when you look at our scores compared to the world in science, math, and reading, United States is number 25 in science, number 46 in math, and number 24 in reading compared to the rest of the world. That's not what puzzles me. What puzzles me is that if our schools are this bad, how come later on in life we produce seven times as many Nobel Prize winners as you have in the any part of the world, we're having innovations from this country, discoveries. Most of the scientific breakthrough comes from the United States. Yet our high school sucks based on this report. Why is that? Anybody? Uh, how about an overall population basis benchmark? Because we got 330 million people here uh, compared to about 60 to 80 million in Canada and the UK, and I don't see Japan up there. Do you think it's population based? No, I, I think that that is a factor, and <coughs> I don't think it's overall. Okay, okay. See, the smart people are talking. I'm listening. <laughs> um, when I look at a lot of these, I see countries that I'm pretty sure are pretty selective on 
the students that they send on and give these tests to. Okay. Where here in the United States, everybody, we everybody. try to educate everybody. Okay, you see, now, as I told you, I'm here to learn also. I didn't know that. But when they send these reports out, they don't say that, do they? Okay, so we have that. Okay. So, well, it's something for us to think about regardless. So what I'm thinking in preparing this thing, what came to my mind was, is it possible that, well, this is what I have called organized chaos. Is it possible that in the elementary school when we started, kids were allowed to explore? They were given the freedom to just learn. There was little structure in the minds of the kids, but the teacher knew what they were doing. Along the way, that changed to where we now put them in a structured environment. We tell them what to do. When I thought middle school, the kids were told to line up down the hallway. You then not look left or right, you just walk down the hallway. We told them when to eat, what to learn, how to learn, how to assess them, structure, structure, structure. Is it possible that along that way, along the way, they lost the fascination of being inquisitive, of being curious, of wanting to learn, because they're always spoon-fed. In most of our schools, before the kids, when the kids are asked questions, before they have a chance to answer, the teacher gives them the answer. We try to help them, not to embarrass them. So something got lost along the way. And research continues to emphasize that kids learn best by exploring the environment. But we take that away from them in middle school. A lot of research has confirmed that the problem starts in middle school. We start losing our kids right at middle school. Because the middle school is designed or was designed to address the needs of the kids there. That kids are curious and energetic. They're abstract thinkers. They're willing to learn if they feel the learning is meaningful. They have short attention span, but we keep them to sit down just like you are for 45 minutes and lecture, lecture, lecture. They benefit from moving around. They love to do new things. When I was a teacher teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I'm here to confess. Altar call. We had a church service this morning. So I'm confessing, most of my teaching strategies did not address that. For one, I had a time limit. TCAP was coming. I didn't have time to do any fun stuff. They had to pass. I was not tenured. My job depended on this. I had two families, to, two kids to feed. Two kids, three dogs, and six goats. Yes, that's what I had. So I didn't have time to do all this nice stuff. I had a lot of discipline problems. Because the kids didn't want to come to school. They didn't want to come to class. And I was the science teacher where if there's any subject you can do fun stuff, I think science is. But nobody had time for all that. So all I'm trying to say, after growing up for a couple of years, sometimes I have to change some things, even if it costs me time, uh, not my job. If it costs me time and even the take up. Because I want the kids to be lifelong learners and not just to pass a test. So, do I hear an amen? amen. Aha, uh -huh, good, we're still in church. So, so when I talk about um, organized chaos, my inspiration came from this book I read. Um, it, was a, it was a survey taken by Gallup of 100 managers all over the world. And the author said, Great managers share one trait, that they, first of all, they break all rules held sacred by conventional wisdom. So throw it out of the window, reform it, change it. When they make some of these strategies and pass it on to us, they don't consider my classroom size. They don't consider that my kids sometimes don't eat before coming into my classroom. They don't have breakfast. They don't consider that. Um, my student just got raped by her mother's boyfriend yesterday, or her younger brother just got shot at the basketball court. And all they care about is, you must teach this, you must do that. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. 
So when that happens, I say forget all what you're going to say. I need to address, first of all, the child's well-being before I can teach the child. There's this statement we've made so many years that has become trite. They don't care what you have to say until they know that you care. How do they say it? Kids don't care what you... Ah, good, you see, I told you I have smart people. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So my philosophy as a teacher that has worked for many years, I don't care what the rules are. It must fit that student, not the classroom. So some of the things we're going to talk about in organized chaos, before I lose you, I know you, I've, I've talked more than I normally talk in class. First of all, what organized chaos is not? Number one, it doesn't mean no rules or no classroom management. I'm talking about organized chaos, not total chaos. So I don't mean no rules. As a matter of fact, in my classroom, there are only two rules. Because I don't see why it should be a rule that you should be respectful to each other. That should be common sense. Why am I going to make that a rule? Don't keep your hands to yourself. You better do that. I don't need to tell you that. So I only have two rules. You know what those two rules are? Thou shalt do nothing to disrupt teaching. Thou shalt do nothing to disrupt learning. I got it from the King James Version. <laughs> two rules. Because the kids know everything else can be categorized under those two things. Don't disturb teaching. Don't disturb learning. If on your cell phone, you're disturbing learning and teaching. So we cannot have an agreement because they will give me an idea what those two rules, how it applies to them. So I don't have to have them memorize 10 rules, 10 procedures, 10 regulations. In the end, they need a test to remember those things. So organized chaos doesn't mean learners should do whatever they want, whenever they want. That's not what I'm advocating. Just do whatever you want to do. No. Organized chaos does not mean no. It does not mean you shouldn't plan. You'll come to find out there's a lot of planning that goes on into this for you to have a class that is student-centered, yet fun for you. So quickly, um, if I'm to summarize organized chaos, this is what I'll say. Number one, the outcomes will be my focus and not the process. So we're trying to learn this topic today. No matter what it takes, we're going to learn it. If it takes you walking around the classroom, going out of the classroom, designing the experiment yourself, we're going to achieve our goal. I am not going to teach class safety by bringing in a real gun to school. Now, that is not, that is just dumb and stupid, not organized chaos. So whatever the process, we're going to achieve our focus. Number two, there is no universal order. I don't care what they say above. See, I'm being recorded, and I'm sure my boss will watch the video. But it's true. No matter what they say up there, I'm the one in the deep trenches fighting the war. I know my students. I know what works well for them. So I'm going to fit the strategy based on Sarah or Nick. How does it fit him? There's no universal. No one class fits all. And there should be order in disorder. Even though it seems like everything is scattered, just like this slide we just went through. If you look at this, the first thing you wonder, some teachers will have who lose their mind looking at this classroom. Kids are learning here. This guy is doing their own stuff. I have no clue what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like <laughs> that's what I'm saying. He's, he's engaged. He's not causing any trouble. Leave him alone. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> it's not bothering you. He's minding his business. He will get it in eighth grade or 10th grade. Just for now, let him be. Well, the, the teacher is here focusing on this, but this is what organized chaos is to me. But to some teachers, no, everybody has to sit. I had a teacher friend who actually measured the distance from one desk to the next desk, and you dare not move that table or that desk. I can't live like that. It's too, and I don't think the kids can live like that where they just have to sit still. I was told by my teacher, my math teacher, that when she was in China, she's my, um, pre cal teacher, that the kids have to sit on their hands all through class. I had a lot of questions <laughs> when she told me that. What if I had a wedgie? How do I take it about? <laughs> so um, 
Let's talk about what organized chaos is quickly. There are elements of organized chaos. Once again, are you ready? This is where the class goes to you. You do not have to agree with me on this strategy. It's worked for me. Will it work for you? I don't know. You have to determine. But the only thing I'm saying here is that try to think outside the box every time. Your student must come first. Whatever you can do to adapt that lesson to your student's needs, do it if it's not against the law. So don't go by all what I'm going to say because remember, I have different sets of kids. When I taught in a low income school, I did things differently than I'm doing now. So there are four aspects of organized chaos. Number one, flexibility. And some of these things you already do. You just don't have a fancy education name to go with it. You already do them. So let's give them a name. As a matter of fact, when I was told to teach on this topic, it was just based on a statement I made innocently when I was given the um, presidential award for teaching, I was interviewed. So I told the reporter, oh, my classroom is an organized chaos. That's what got me in trouble. But when I went online to search, I actually found there was a teaching strategy called organized chaos. I said, look at that. So I've been doing something that was actually recognized by research. I didn't know. So spontaneity, creativity, and independence. Am I speaking too fast? You all are lying. <laughs> so there are four things here we're going to address. Let's start with the first one. Again, you don't have to agree with me. Flexibility. There are four things I do, maybe more than four. So there are four things I want to share with you. I do more than, this. I do more than four things, but because of time, four things. Number one, I say be prepared to switch a lesson midway. Give frequent breaks during class. Negotiate. Change sitting arrangement frequently. We'll talk about some of this briefly, and I'll let you also give me some of your ideas, how, flexi how flexibility can help your classroom. OK, so be prepared to switch your lesson midway. For those of you, how many of you are biology teachers here? What? <laughs> oh, well, I should have prepared for that. In any case, I was teaching respiration in the class, and it's such an abstract concept because there are so many things they cannot appreciate. The sad thing is it took me to graduate school to appreciate some of this. The kids could not get it. I tried explaining. I tried describing. I spoke in three different languages. It didn't work. <laughs> so I stopped halfway. And I always have backup plans. So I just allowed them to watch a video on respiration and went home to think again, how can I explain this to them? Then guess what? I found this. Well, this is not a real one, but I, this is a replica I bought from a garage sale. I was trying to explain the ATP synthesis. And what this concept does in the cell is there's something we have in our mitochondria that forces ADP and inorganic phosphate, forces them together. It's, been, it's, it's powered by hydrogen ions. They could not imagine powered by hydrogen ions. So I ended the lesson midway. Then the next day, I came back with this. And I told the students, picture my hands or my finger as the hydrogen ion. Picture this as the ATP synthase knob. And when the hydrogen ion goes through, it actually spins the knob and forces ADP to fuse with ATP. And if you Google ATP synthase, don't do that now while I'm teaching. <laughs> I promise you, it looks almost like this. So we could have gone on and on all day trying to explain a concept. I would have been frustrated. They would have been frustrated. And they would have given up. So it's OK to stop your lesson halfway if you have to. So you identify your desired result. Determine evidence. Are they learning? You ask questions in between. You plan learning experience and instruction. You assess it as you go on in between, as I'm about to do, because I'm going to call you all to ask you questions. And if it's not working, redirect instruction as needed. It's OK to stop a lesson halfway and tell your children, your students, this is not working out. Let's pick up tomorrow. What are we going to do for the rest of the class? 
I don't know. What do you want to do? <laughs> can we go out? No, we can't go out. Can we go home? No, you can't go home. <laughs> can we talk about the shooting in this? That's a good topic. Let's talk. That's okay. It's time well spent than trying to make sure you cover the curriculum that day and nobody gets, gains anything from it. You'll be amazed the things I've learned about my students in those impromptu discussions. So many things, and you'll be amazed what they've learned about me. Quickly. Then, sitting arrangement. This is the traditional way we're told to have students sit. When I taught in my low-income school, when I turn around to teach and write on the board, you wouldn't believe those suckers are back there selling cards. There was this time cards were, in, they were trading cards. There was, my wife told me at a point in time in her school, they were even selling weed. So when she turned around, she saw a bag of, a Ziploc bag of weed just fly from one room, from one end of the hall to the other classroom. <laughs> so this doesn't work. This is not a good idea. Now, for some topics, you may use it. But when your classroom is always like this 24-7 for the whole year, I think it doesn't create an a good learning environment. So my proposal is change those seats during the week. Monday, you could have this, if that's what you want to do, if they're watching a movie. Or even middle of the class, you could have them all get up and change their seats. It looks disorganized, just telling kids, OK, we're done watching the movie. Get up, move your chairs, come around. But it's a good change of environment for them. So what I'm advocating is make time to change your seats through the school year, through the day through the week. Flexibility entails giving kids frequent breaks, which I'm about to do to you very soon. When you teach, I teach a class of two periods per class. So I'm teaching for 55 minutes times two. I cannot talk for that long. Neither should the kids sit down and learn. They're, for most of us, we can't survive faculty meeting past 15 minutes. So why do we expect our students to sit for two hours listening to us? So stop your class in between. Have them walk around. Insist they get up and walk around. Give them breaks. Then negotiate. See, these kids are not too smart, I promise you. This is what I do. If I want something to be turned in on Monday, I tell them I want it turned in on Friday. Then they complain, that's too soon. That's before the weekend. Why can't we do it on Monday? I said, no. It has to be turned in on Friday. <sighs> but I have a game. Too bad, you're going to lose some points. Please, can we just turn it in on Monday? No, please. OK, that's fine. Monday is fine with me. They feel empowered. I feel I've gotten the best of them. Win-win. <laughs> Win-win. I tell them the paper they have to write is 12 pages. No, yes. Come on, let's make it six. No, six. Yeah, high school students call it six. Come on, no, seven. Please, six, seven, done. I actually wanted five pages. <laughs> now I'm getting seven pages. They feel empowered and they love me that I'm very considerate. <laughs> Give them room to feel as if they've won. Don't come out as the bully, as the parent. We don't like when they do it to us. So let's make these kids feel, in the end, when Christmas comes, or end of the year, you get all those gift cards. I think I brought some to show you all even. I got so many Starbucks gift cards, and I don't even drink Starbucks. <laughs> See? They love me, but I took advantage of them. So do that. Be flexible with the kids. <laughs> now, your turn. We've talked about flexibility. Discuss in your group. How can you bring flexibility to your job? What are ideas you can do? You have two minutes to do that, please. Flexibility. I know we would love to keep talking, which is one of the things we're going to discuss. But let's just get three ideas from people, um, from anybody. You can tell me, I would prefer you tell me what your group members said, not what you suggested. It's really better when you tell what someone said and I do this in my classroom. Okay, show off. 
So tell me, can you share ideas with me? Something said in your group that you really like, because I'm here to steal. Teachers are thieves. We steal, steal, steal. So I'm going to steal. Next week, she is doing um, flexible seating next year in her class, where okay. they've gotten rid of all of her desks. And she described it, it's going to be like different, like on the floor and certain types of chairs. And I thought that was very, that's. Wow. It's one of the things we're going to talk about soon. <laughs> Getting rid of chairs. Very good. Very good, very good. I like that, yes. She said that she makes her kids stand up and be a tree. And then it's like, just like stand up, be a tree, just to stand up and kind of like, ex like extend your extremities in some form or fashion. And if they don't do it, it's you're going to stand in the chair and do it. So that way it's like, oh, okay. And eventually at the end of the year, it's like, okay, we're going to do this and it's fine. And it's wow. Do you notice a difference when you do that? Yes. Just after, what, what difference I, do you notice? I just watch, like, I teach math and science for fourth grade. And we do a fourth grade fractions and multiplication. So their eyes kind of glaze over sometimes. Mm. And when they start to do that, that's the, the I, I will just stop mid sentence and say, everybody be a tree. And so they immediately have to stand up and assume some sort of pose. Um, or we'll do the mannequin challenge. That's another one that I do. And we'll say mannequin. You stand and they still. Have to completely freeze. Um, and it just kind of it, it stops them and it gets them thinking about something completely different. And then it gives me an opportunity to do, like you said, I can kind of go backwards and kind of move in a different direction, because obviously- Excellent. And they've not figured out a name for that strategy yet. You should pattern it and make it a strategy. <laughs> I love it, I love it, see? Even my, you see, this will work even for high school students. We all think high school stickers, who get, my high school students love, my college students love stickers. The, the teachers, when I teach, uh, um, for, for, professional uh, faculty meetings. They love stickers. So don't think this is just too elementary. Everybody loves stickers. Everybody loves to play. I'm sure you would love stickers if I brought stickers also. OK, one more, one more. Then we go quickly. I have four more things. Yes. Well, it's something that she said. It goes back to the beginning of your presentation when you said not only how does it affect students, but what about the teacher? She said her favorite time is when they do their centers and they get to move around, and that's when they're flexible. So she said, that's my favorite time. It gives you time to unwind and to reg very good. You see, think of yourself too, guys. Believe it or not, your insurance doesn't co cover PTSD. <laughs> so if at the end, this kid stress you, I'm sorry, no offense for real people with that. I'm being serious that our mental health is as important as their learning also. If we must continue long term, we have to take care of ourselves also. So for you principals here, if you must sell an idea that we should buy into, Kind of tell us one or two things that will benefit us also in that suggestion. It will help us to know, okay, you're also thinking about us. So thank you for sharing. Let's quickly go to the second one. I had fun doing this PowerPoint, all these things. <laughs> I wanted to make all of them like this. It was so much fun. Okay, spontaneity. Allow impromptu discussions. Spontaneous and ongoing assessment. Don't sacrifice enthusiasm over order. So kids are stretching their hands to answer questions, and you get mad at them. You're killing their spirit, especially the elementary school ones. So somebody comes up with an impromptu discussion. Oh, I've had many of those. I'm teaching about the cell cycle, or I'm teaching about macromolecules. From nowhere, the student asks, so how did you get to America? In those days, I know they are trying to make fun of me and just trying to get me riled up, but I've learned with experience. So I say, what do you think? How did I get here? I don't know. You probably swam or swung, sw uh, you swung from tree to tree. <laughs> I said, hmm, that's one way. So we keep talking. I say, OK, there are only two choices you have here. I took a boat or I flew. What do you think? Well, I guess you flew. Very good. Do you also know, do you know what also is important in Africa? We eat a lot of starchy food. Do you know why we eat starchy food? No, why? Because why, I mean, what do we get from carbohydrate? It gives you energy. I've moved the topic back to macromolecules. Nobody's angry, nobody's upset, and I've even told them one or two things about Africa. And we move on. Impromptu questions from the kids sometimes can reveal something they don't know or something they're bothering with. Or you could tell me you're not paying attention. 
and I'm not going to show you that I'm upset. I'm the adult in the room. I'm going to still be under control. Um, let's talk about one or two things. Spontaneous discussion. So, those people that know more than I do said, while good discussions can be a powerful tool for encouraging student learning, successful discussion rarely happens spontaneously. I disagree. It depends on what you do as a professional. How do you use those discussion? Bring it back to the topic and even make it a learning experience. But don't dismiss the kids and make it seem as if what you have to say is not important, even though you know it's not. But let's just play along with them. Remember, it's about empowering the kids. So you can take a detour to address that unrelated question and bring it back to your topic of the day. Spontaneous and ongoing formative assessment. When do you give your quizzes during the day? Anybody? At the end, guess what I'll do as a student? Zone you out till the end of the day. And I may flunk the quiz, but oh well, in the end. You won't know if it was something you did wrong or the student was not following. Consider this. Why not surprise them midway as you discuss when they least expect? Warn them beginning of the year. In between my PowerPoint, you will see some quizzes popping up. If you're not paying attention, you'll have a quiz that you won't be able to answer. So when we surprise them in this way, you force them to pay attention. So as you teach from nowhere, just give them a quiz. Even if you don't grade the quiz, the idea is that, or grade it, you may not enter it into your grade book, but that will force them to pay attention. So anticipation holds their attention. Because my students know when I say, do you have any question? And nobody says anything. I say, fine, take out a piece of paper. So along the way, they now know when I say, do you have any question? Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Sometimes I don't even tell them. So spontaneous and ongoing assessments, excellent. The next element is be creative. Different learning strategy, different ways of assessing. Standing up classrooms. Somebody said that, or no chair classroom. It's an ongoing thing people are saying these days. Take away the chairs. So let's talk about each of these, if we have the time. Standing classroom engages students with their curriculum and gets them up and moving. Now, some of your desk, including mine in my classroom, does not make me able to do this as often as I want. So it may not work well for you. Whoever designed those desks in the classroom should be jailed. Because the kids have a hard time squeezing in to get in. And when they get in, they can't even move around. It's just ve very bad. Back at home, frankly, all they had was a stool and a desk. That was even better. They could move around, move the stool around. This is so inconvenient. inconvenient. So, but if you have them stand up with that desk, and I've tried this in some um, settings where the desk was a little bit high, and the kids stood up all through the class. It made good engagement. They could move around, and they could pay more attention because you're sitting so comfortably. Some of you are already half asleep because you're too comfortable. But when you're standing, you're more engaged. Consider doing this. One day, your kids come into the classroom, no cheer. And they're wondering, what is going on? Did we get robbed? No. <laughs> this is a new strategy. So consider this also as, as, as an option. Um, we love to hear ourselves talk. They call it the sage on the stage. We just love to talk. Funny thing, see, the kids love to talk also. My mentor once told me, the one doing the talking, that, that's not my mentor, sorry. She, <laughs> she's going to be very mad if she sees this picture. The one doing the talking is the one doing the learning. The reason we are so smart as teachers is because we've taught this many years. So we seem like we know it a lot. No. The more you talk, the more you learn. Let them do the talking. And you just cash the check. Let them talk. They love it anyway. So let them talk more. Flip your classroom. The traditional classroom has you lecture for most of the time, and the kids have homework activities. Why not start off the lecture and let them continue from where you stopped? And even give them a chance to start their homework. 
if there were five questions or the homework, have them do two in the classroom and finish the rest. At least they feel they've started already. So give them enough time to collaborate. It builds collaboration and also um, cooperation. So give them time to talk. It's amazing that with all this strategy, you would think my students do poorly in the class because I'm so much into how they perform. But nobody fails my class. Are they all that smart? No. There are several reasons why they don't fail. And I'll tell you a story for those new teachers. When I was a new teacher, I believed strongly in you must teach your work. If not, you fail. But as I grew older, I started wondering, why does it bother us so much when the kids don't do their work? Why do we get so upset? Because we are crazy. <laughs> or because we care about them. My kids don't fail. And do you know why they don't fail? Well, because this is, most of them come up. This is an actual grade after one semester. Nobody made a C in one of the class. Nobody made a B. I do not curve grade. And I don't give points for bringing paper towels. I, I hate that. Because in the long run, if you make an A because you brought lots of paper towels, <laughs> does that really show that you know the subject? So I don't give grades for those things. You must earn every grade. I had a student who was taking AP chemistry, and the teacher was giving points for paper towel. One of them went to Costco and bought the whole. <laughs> Another student, I kid, kid you not, brought 200 paper towels and said this will do for the whole year. He's a smart kid. He was just trying to be funny because he got into Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, um, Yale, Washington. He went to Stanford. But why do we give grades for things that doesn't relate to learning? Or even, <coughs> why do we penalize them for things that doesn't relate to the concept? So you didn't write your name on the paper. You get a zero. What does that have to do with English? Now, I take off points if you don't write your names on your test. But guess what? I give it right back to them. They're just not smart enough to see that it didn't change the grade. But on the paper, I put minus 10. But in reality, it doesn't go into the grade book. So if a child fails a class because of he or she didn't write his or her name for several tests, will you say the child does not know math or doesn't just remember how to write his or her name? So how do I get to this point? Well, for one, I have multiple ways of assessing the kids. My district has it that you must have 10% for homework, so that cannot change. But I have so many ways the kids can be assessed. My students, 99% of them fail all their tests, every test. Yet, they make an A at the end because the lab has 20% of the grade. And all you have to do to get that 100 on the lab, do the lab. Even if it doesn't work out, that's fine. You get 100. Even if the lab fails, that's fine. A lot of us didn't get this the first time. I know I didn't. It took me going to graduate school to understand some concepts in biology. So the kids will learn later on. Some of the math concept, I understood some of those math concept when I finished high school. So I'm not here to penalize. Learning is an ongoing process. It's a journey, not a destination. So why do we think they must get it in your class? And if they don't, they will get an F. We just learned this morning that F damages. And again, I was once there. But I'm reevaluating for the past couple of years. Before I give a child an F, I must have tried everything possible. And only one child has failed my class in the last seven, eight years because she was caught cheating after warning her several times. So I give an F. So other than just summarizing the child's grade, I watched a TED talk. And the lady was saying in some schools, they're considering taking out F. And all they write now is, not yet. So if a child doesn't pass a test, she doesn't get an F. The teacher just puts, not yet. Making the child realize you still have a chance. Yes, sir. At my school, my principal has a rule that 
no student can make, uh, you can't give a grade lower than a 60. Because if you give a grade lower than 60, I know from personal experience that um, when I was in high school, I failed one of my grades because I got a 30 something <laughs> one nine weeks. If I'd have got a 60, you could have. I, you know, I pulled all my grades up and I would have passed. But because of that, I failed. But he wants to give them the chance to be able to overcome that, and that's why. Is he hiring? Come we'll work for him. But uh, it's, yes, please. I, I had a principal same way, and he said, he said an F is an F. He said you give a child a sixty versus a zero or a twenty. He said they have, you know, they're both an F, but the sixty gives them so much more of a chance well, of coming back to a C or a B, whereas the twenty has just killed their average, and they're not even at that point they know. That is over, it's done. And you know, you know, let me tell you one crazy thing I also believe in. If you've been to my class all year, I don't care if you failed all my tests and everything, you will make at least a D. Just by being in class, I believe you must have learned something. You make a D. I don't see why you've, even if you didn't make the effort, but you were present for 180 days or less, I will give you an F just because you didn't understand that concept at that particular time, or point in time, there's still opportunity for you. This is something else I believe in. For you math students, I mean math teachers, see I'm calling you students, can you understand two steps equation without understanding one step equation? Okay, so let's say a child fails your topic, it's crappy. Your child fails when you taught one step equation, got a 50. Three weeks after, you now taught two steps equation, and for whatever reason, or however the child understood two steps equation, I made a 90. As a teacher, I would average that grade and change both. It doesn't cost me anything. They don't pay me extra. I wish they did. For every child I failed, then I will have failed everybody. So why do we feel Giving that child a chance to succeed is against our core moral fiber, what we believe in. You didn't get every topic the first time it was taught, and you still don't understand every topic the first time it is taught. So my opinion, give them a chance. If I have to do the paperwork to go back and change the grade, I will do it rather than damage that child's psyche. Consider this, you have the power, but I've never known a child who was shown grace, who later became successful and <laughs> laughed at you and said, I got the best of you, sucker. Just give them a chance. It's not, it may not be your place to explain that concept. Somebody else will take, take off from there. So have multiple ways out. I failed a lot of multiple choice questions. I wasn't good in multiple choice because it's so, as it's called, multiple choice. You either want question, one answer or not but I could write a lot of essays. <coughs> Thank God my teacher gave me that chance. Well, he didn't have a choice. We didn't have scantrons <laughs> back in Nigeria, so he had to grade it by hand. So we had a lot of frequent FRQ questions. So quickly, quickly, I'm losing my crowd. Um, I can tell, I'm a teacher. So rethink traditional method of assessment in the classroom. As I said here, revisit past assessments if they show mastery in other concepts. Give them a rubric and have them grade their own papers. Oh, this is a good one. My kids were failing the FRQs. Think about this. They failed the FRQ part of the AP Biology because I couldn't give them questions that had frequent response questions. It will entail me going home with tons of papers, bare work, grade, quiz, FRQs. So I stopped giving them FRQs and they were doing poorly until somebody suggested why not let them grade their own papers? Now, check with your district. But this is what I do. For every bell work, three questions, when we're done, each student has a red pen. They bring out their red pen, and I, can, I don't trust them that much, so I closely watch. You put away your pencil, you have a red pen. And I give you the rubric and the answer to grade. At the end, I spot check to make sure you didn't give yourself points, and you know for sure if I get you giving yourself points you didn't deserve, you get a zero on that. 
Do you know how many papers I go home to grade? I don't. They grade it, and we discuss it. So if you are bold enough to tell me, I wrote this, is it correct? And I will explain to you, well, you should have left, you left something out there, I will have given you the point. But if you're not, you come see me during lunch and we'll discuss. If you're not comfortable grading, bring it to me, I'll grade it. But it helps me and it helps us to discuss. So consider those things. Um, does your test cover skills and knowledge? So what else are you testing when you give them a test or a project? Ah, quickly, because this is the last one. Independence. Number one. The traditional ways you have kids that are high achievers teaching kids that are low achievers. I turn the table upside down. The low achieving kids are going to prep to explain the next day to the high achieving kids. <coughs> Remember what we said. He doing the talking is the one doing the learning. If that child can go home and learn and practice and struggle to explain that concept, that child is learning. Learning, we think learning is when you finally close the gap and come up with the answer. That's not learning. Learning is the process of you trying to do that. So even if the child struggles with words to explain this or how to say it, that child is learning. If you allow the child who is already succeeding explain to the weak child, the weak child is not learning. The stronger one is doing the learning. So consider flipping the table. Do not answer all questions. If they ask you, throw it back at them. Or leave it unanswered. Let them go figure it out. There are some questions I don't answer till the end of the year, and I get emails back the year after. Do you know that what I asked you last year? Uh huh. I finally found the answer. Great. It took us one year, but we did. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a problem with a talkative group last year. They tried to stall class by asking crazy questions. That would, it went along with our learning, but they would still ask questions. So I turned that into our challenge questions. So Very we, good. And so I would put them up there. And if you, you had to email me. We, we're one to one. So mm. they would go home. They would research, email me their research with a short paragraph about it. And then I gave them extra points or extra rewards in class for that. That's one way to shut them down. Take it for homework. Do the research and turn it in tomorrow. Watch that child ask question next time. <laughs> so if the question was meant to, because some of them go back. I teach some very intelligent kids. They go find out some very tough questions, maybe to embarrass me in class. And they ask me. And I either tell them, I really don't know. But you know what? You go find out the research and write me a two-page paper on that. <laughs> that works all the time. Yes, ma'am? I have a word wrong. OK. Tonight, and one of the words that I put up there the very first year is the word pertinent. Uh, it's what? Pertinent. Oh, OK. Pertinent. I thought you were speaking African language. And, and uh, they have to make sure that their questions are not pertinent, or they have to use the word, this question is not necessarily pertinent, but <laughs> they have to use, at least use that word in a sentence to show that they know what it means and that they know they're a little off topic. <laughs> I'll, I'll use that. I'm going to steal that. Any more suggestion? Anybody with something else you do to help curve Maybe assist them in questioning or curb unnecessary questions. OK. So um, let them struggle, even if they fail in the task. I'm here to confess again. I have purposefully sabotaged a lot of the experiments. I have put the wrong plasmid or the wrong um, chemical they needed, and the experiment failed. They still don't know I did that. We spent a whole class time trying to figure out what could have gone wrong. And I also joined them in the brainstorming session, knowing fully well what went wrong. In, a, in an effort to pick out what could have gone wrong, you will be amazed what my students have come up with. In research, 90% of what they're going to do will not work. So they need, they need to get used to that. They think life is all about you put this and this and you get a result. No. So let them struggle. Even if they have to fail, just be there to catch them. Now, quickly, I'm going into some sermons now. Failure sometimes is an option. More than 60 years ago, 
the three employees, now this I copied exactly from the internet, didn't change any word, just in case you see it. More than 60 years ago, three employees of San Diego-based Rocket Chemical Company were trying to develop a product that would prevent rust. They tried and kept careful records. They labeled their first effort water displacement number one, or WD1. I'll bet you, you have figured out how many times they failed <laughs> before they finally got successful. So it's OK. Let them struggle, let them fail. I'm not saying F at the end of their grade, the year, but in a class, it's OK. Be there to mitigate the effect. Students need to know that adults try and fail and fail and fail and keep on trying. More than that, they need to experience failure. While I'm a big fan, this is John Miro saying this, while I'm a big fan of project-based learning, and we just learned about blended learning, I believe the most critical piece of pedagogical puzzle is what we ought to call problem-based learning. Projects where the teacher already know the outcome won't work, especially with older students. It's OK. When the kids ask you a question, always answer first, what do you think? Give them a chance to think. Don't be in a hurry to show them that you know the answer. They already know you know. Give them a chance to think. And if they say, I don't know, then OK, I don't know also. You go find out. My best teachers were not the ones who knew all the answers, but those who were deeply excited by the questions they couldn't answer. There was this Nobel Prize winner who was once asked, why did you become a scientist rather than a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman? like the other immigrant kids in the neighborhood. My mother made me a scientist without ever intending to. Every other Jewish mother in Brooklyn would ask her child after school, so did you learn anything today? My mother would ask a different question. Easy, did you ask a good question today? Teach them how to ask questions because asking questions made him a good scientist. Did you ask a good question today? That could be a test. Have the kids write up questions about the topic and grade it. That's something we don't usually do. We have, we have them ask an answer, have an answer. Math teachers, give them a number. Let them come up with an equation that would arrive at that number. So I can come up with 60. And I'll tell them to write all possible ways, all possible things you can come up with 60. 30 times 2, and they go on. <coughs> That's one way to turn the table. OK, um, when students know how to ask their own questions, in research, asking the right question is the foundation for successful research. Ask the right questions. It depends on comprehension. This skill is rarely, if ever, taught to students today. Um, moving on, typically questions are seen as a, we're going to stop there, from that lady there. So group reflection, quickly. Now we're going to talk because I've talked too long. How does the culture of a classroom need to change in order to be more student-centered? Just quickly, spend a minute, talk about that. From all we've talked about so far, I have 15 more minutes and I'll be done, I promise you. How does the culture of a classroom need to change now? One minute, quickly, please. So let's take one suggestion, then we'll move on. Again, I'll be more than willing to email you the PowerPoint if there's anything you think you like there. Somebody share with us, please. Anybody? Yes. She said that sometimes when she says a child who's very smart, but can somewhat take it forward for their behavior issues, she'll have to get up and just kind of teach the class and the lesson. And that they typically do a very good job with that. In our previous days, I would have had that child go sit at the corner there and do his work by himself. And nobody would win because he would be there tapping on the table or doing something just to irritate me. Then I would yell at him in my African language and the child would cry. Thank you. So try to make it where it benefits you. Um, I, I wish I could hear from you or some teachers, but oh, I know you have to go. So let's quickly finish this. Now, I'm going to skim over this. It just talks about benefits and guidelines for organized chaos. Now, 
guess what? I didn't come up with any of this. I got it from this website that says seven ways to organize chaos. Seven ways organized chaos can lead to great things at work. It wasn't written for school. So all I did was press Control F and change every word that, comes, that says employee, and I just put student. And it works out well. So this was written for, work, for uh, companies, but it works out just perfectly for students. So I changed work to school. So this author said, organized chaos focuses on students. We've just talked about that. Um, it empowers the student. Again, I'll leave my email here if you want. Please be sure to ask me. I'll forward it to you. It fosters critical thinking. It fuels engagement. It provides learning opportunities. It stimulates adaptability. It sparks collaboration. And this is my typical lab here. You can see I'm not in the background because I'm taking the pictures, but typically I don't engage the students in this lab work. What I do is I find one or two students who will serve as the lab assistant. He or she is responsible to read the protocol, get all the equipment ready, set up the lab, and the kids go to him if they're looking for anything, and I just sit back and let them work. Now, if it's something that I need to be a part of where they're using dangerous stuff, I'll be there, but you, most of the time, they do well handling their own homework, and my kids do college-level research, and they do very well at it. So they do their work, and I just facilitate if I have to. Rounding up quickly. Tell me one thing your teacher did that made learning engaging. Just one person, something you remember. High school, middle school, elementary, that you just cannot forget. She used to do this. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my third grade teacher, I sat in a old Tommy bathtub and recited <laughs> my multiplication tables. In school? Yes, she had an old claw tub bathtub. And we would sit in, each student had their turn of sitting in that bathtub and sitting there. I don't know. <laughs> well, the reason I ask that, guys, is most of the times we don't remember the content. We remember how we learned the content. If each day is not spent trying to build memory with these kids, I think it's a day wasted. They will forget the biology. They will forget most of the math. But they will not forget how you made them feel or how you taught them that subject. So we should be in the business of creating memories not just teaching the subject. That's what I believe in. So in my classroom, I do a lot of crazy things. When I teach the immune system, I dress up in camouflage. Yeah, that's, our teacher. that's our art teacher. Yeah. Ah, tell her we use her. <laughs> See? <laughs> well, I only brought this to show you how you should appear in class every day. The point is, you should be like this every day in class, not literally, but your classroom should be filled with varieties, not just one color. Do different things in the classroom, different ways. Every day should be something new for the kids. Keep them guessing. Keep them looking forward to you. Sew a suit that has those colors if you have to. Serve dishes that have different things for the kids. They should know that in this class, I'm going to do something new or something different today, and I can't wait to be there. So. Um, Again, feedback, I know. So this is a result, actually. Challenges that make your job more difficult. This is what the research says. Again, it's non-scientific, but I kind of agree with it. Because the new teachers don't care about the administrators for, for a while. They don't care about all the meetings. They're still excited. We're going to faculty meeting, yay! <laughs> 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 to them, testing is, yes, let's find out what the research says. Uh, but we all teachers say, are you kidding? The last testing experience we had with computer breakdown. Uh, so uh, 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 new teachers don't care about salary. I'm making this much, wow. Uh, then you have your first child, second child, third, fifth. <laughs> you start wondering. Um, the last part of the presentation in five minutes just tells you, these are testimonials from my kids. This is what they've said in the past. They've said the class prepared them well for college. They learned so much in the class. Yes, I actually brought the head of a cow. I killed a cow, and I brought the, the actual head of a cow. 
guess what they remembered? They didn't remember all what we talked about. They remembered he brought the head of a cow to class. <laughs> we have a crime scene where we do uh, a replica of somebody getting shot, but I won't do that these days. It's too sensitive, so we'll just let that go. Uh, this is what they spend their time. You see. <laughs> Students did all this. What do they think about me? They said, yes, teacher will work to make you succeed. It has worked well. This is some of the publications I've had to publish with my students on research papers. So you have high school students, 11th grade, publishing scientific papers. Some of them, we've published about 12. So we challenge them, even though we make it fun for them. And we've been successful in our AP results, where you have most of the kids making 100% passing rate. I bring this not to present to you that I'm an awesome teacher. I bring it to present to you that the kids can be made to learn and you don't have to do the hard work. Because I won't say this success was because of how I taught, but rather how I made them to learn. So we can do it in the classroom and I'm looking forward to next year. I can't wait for next year to come. Okay, I'm required to give credit. <laughs> Everything here, apart from the last two slides, came from the internet. <laughs> Nothing was mine. Said that. Quickly, let's end up by saying thank you so much for paying attention. <laughs> <laughs>